please be seated. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator, Gordon Peterson. Mr. Peterson's 44 years broadcast experience in the nation's capital has led to countless awards. He is currently senior correspondent and anchor of ABC7 WJLA-TV's News at 6 p.m. Welcome, Gordon Peterson. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I'm not used to using a microphone. Little joke. Welcome, to, uh, Tony, thank you very much, and welcome to the uh, 21st Annual Federal Interagency Holocaust Remembrance Program here at Washington's historic Lincoln Theater. Uh, I want to thank now the U.S. Army Brass Quintet, led by Master Sergeant Terry Bingham for the musical prelude. Thank you very much. Uh, today our program includes greetings from President Barack Obama, as you see on your screen. Well, look in your program, it's in there. <laughs> and uh, we also have a keynote address by uh, Major General Sharon K.G. Dunbar, the commander of the Air Force District of Washington. We will hear from a survivor of the Nazi death camp at Auschwitz. We will hear from a man whose Jewish mother believed that her seven-year-old son's best chance of survival was to put him out on the streets with a Catholic baptismal certificate in his pocket. And we'll hear from a man who survived a modern concentration camp nearly 50 years after the end of World War II. Elie Wiesel, himself a Holocaust survivor, says it is the duty of the survivor to bear witness for the living, because to forget the dead would be like killing them a second time. Thus, we come together today in a building named for the man who freed this nation from the moral obscenity of slavery. We're here to bear witness. Please stand for the presentation of colors by the U.S. Navy Color Guard and our national anthem played by the U.S. Army Brass Quintet. Please be seated. And please join me in thanking the U.S. Navy Color Guard and the U.S. Army Brass Quintet.
Allow me now to introduce our keynote speaker, Major General Sharon K.G. Dunbar, the Commander of the Air Force District of Washington and the 320th Air Expeditionary Wing headquartered at Joint Base Andrews. The Air Force District of Washington is responsible, among other things, for organizing, training, and equipping combat forces for aerospace expeditionary forces and homeland operations, and it provides major command level support for 60,000 military and civilian personnel worldwide. Major Dunbar is a 1982 graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy. She's also the Uniform Code of Military Justice Authority for 40,000 airmen, which means uh, a big part of her job, I think, is to make the troops toe the line. She's not a minor job. Major General Dunbar, please. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, for the very kind introduction. Um, I have to say I'm very honored to be here today uh, in the presence of uh, the distinguished panel that we're going to hear from and, and all of you who took time out to attend this very important occasion. Thanks. I'd like to thank Ms. Tina Heller for, uh, and Tina's essentially been the chair for organizing today's event, and um, she offered me the opportunity to be able to speak. I was talking to Tina yesterday and just learned her story, and this is in the power of stories that we share what we learn from individuals. Tina's father was a POW in Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. So I appreciate Tina taking time to share the, her story, much like we're going to have our panel members today share their stories so that we can learn from them. If you'll indulge with me, I'd like to take a few moments to highlight a Hungarian-born Holocaust survivor who actually came to the United States in order to give back, serving in our United States Army. His name is Mr. Tibor Rubin. A few weeks ago, I watched the video of this very impressive veteran and the story that he had to tell. And I wanted to be able to share that with you because he is an inspiration to all of us who serve in uniform and a reminder to all of us that we can pay forward goodness no matter what we face in life. To just keep you being there alive. It was a terrible thing. And I was very lucky. The Army came in, United States Army. It was very nice to us, you know. They picked us up and they big bring us in a, back to life. That time I promised that if I ever get out of there, somehow I go to the United States, I would somehow have to repeat it what they did. Like our distinguished panel members today, Mr. Rubin was an eyewitness to evil. And yet, while he could have allowed evil to crush his spirit, he instead chose to allow the promise, the hope, and the courage of humankind to ignite his spirit like our panel members today. At the young age of, eight, of 13, this young man was taken to another world, Mount Hausen concentration camp in Austria. At a time when young men begin their journey from teenager to adulthood, Mr. Rubin began his journey into the abyss of evil. Like others here today, he lost both parents and two sisters to the Nazis. At a time when he should have been celebrating and being celebrated, he experienced the horror and one by one saw his family and friends perish. Then after a long two years, what surely must have seemed like a lifetime to him, he was liberated by American military forces. And it was at that moment that Mr. Rubin vowed that he would give back. He would repay the gift of life that he was given by serving in the United States military and came to the United States and did just that in order to combat evil in future years. He immigrated to the United States in 1948 and joined the Army just two years later. And from then, his story is truly amazing. What the video didn't tell us is that during the Korean War, he was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division's 8th Regiment, where, ironically, records show an anti-Semitic non-commissioned officer was assigned to him and assigned him the dangerous missions, the most dangerous missions possible, 
in the hopes of getting him killed. Instead, Mr. Rubin wound up being nominated three times for the Medal of Honor, the highest honor that any military member can receive. According to Army records, his Medal of Honor paperwork was never processed because that same non-commissioned officer ignored the orders to submit them. Thankfully, Mr. Rubin's actions in Korea finally received their long overdue recognition when Je President George Bush presented him the Medal of Honor on September 23, 2005, over 55 years later. I initially thought that I wanted to pay homage to Mr. Rubin today because he was a Holocaust survivor, a Korean War veteran, and received the Medal of Honor. But as with most stories, when you hear them, you hear grains that relate to your own, just like we're going to hear from our panel members today. From a personal standpoint, like many who have experienced wars, my Korean grandfather and my oldest uncle were captured and force marched and perished along the way, never to be heard from again. And like many around the world, seeking a better life, my mother's parents quietly shipped her to the United States in 1947 in order to ensure her safety and security. And like Mr. Rubin and so many other immigrants who come to the United States, my mother was forever grateful for the opportunities that she was afforded in the new life offered to her. And she ensured her, share, her children understood our responsibility to give back. What struck me when I first watched the video was hearing how Mr. Rubin cared for his fellow prisoners in the POW camp, how he risked his own life in order to help others, and how he stayed up through the night, lacking sleep in order to tend to his fellow prisoners of war. There was also something that he said that really caught my attention. If you feel hate for your fellow man, you'll only hurt yourself. If you feel hate for your fellow man, you'll only hurt yourself. Such a simple statement, and yet it's so profound. These are words that we should all live by, and certainly words that we ought to be teaching our young. I was also struck by Mr. Rubin's commitment to come to America so he could give back. <coughs> he understood the power of intervention, and he paid it forward by serving others. World War II ended less than 70 years ago. The Holocaust claimed the lives of six million innocent people just because of their heritage, and a proud heritage at that. Unfortunately, since World War II, our global community has seen more incidents of genocide, perhaps not to the magnitude of the six million killed during the Holocaust, but it continues. And it's important that we not forget. In Cambodia during the 70s, anywhere from 1.5 to 3 million, the range of 1.5 difference there are difficult to determine because so many are, remain unaccounted for. These individuals murdered at the hands of the Khmer Rouge. In April 1992, the government of Yugoslavia, the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina, de de declared its independence from Yugoslavia. And over the next several years, Bosnian Serb forces, with the backing of the Serb-dominated Yugoslav army, targeted both Bosnian Muslims and Croatian civilians, resulting in the death of some 100,000 people by 1995. The UN estimates as many as 300,000 people have been killed fighting in Darfur over the past decade, while another 2 million have been displaced. And the mass slaughter of the Tutsi and the moderate Hutu in Rwanda by members of the Hutu majority in 1994 left 500,000 to 1 million Rwandans being murdered. International Holocaust Remembrance Day is about international communities standing together to condemn hatred, bigotry, and intolerance in every form. It's a time to reflect on the atrocities that were committed in the past, lest we forget what happens when people fail to act. We'll never be able to prevent differences in thought, opinion, or conflict, often sparked by religion, cultural differences, and beliefs. But we must do whatever we can to prevent our current and future generations from making the same mistakes of the past. But just to remember is not enough. 
We must be prepared to stand up and speak out against hatred, bigotry, intolerance, and the perpetration of evil. To not endure it in silence. We cannot afford to wait when something happens before we take a stand. We must always be talking about it, such as with our panel today. We have the responsibility to teach our children at the very young age, but also adults, that hatred for our fellow man, as Mr. Rubin mentioned, has no place in modern civilized society. I'm proud to know that American military forces and Holocaust survivors are inextricably linked. And I understand the importance of sharing the stories in these forums so that others can learn. The intervention by US forces in the Holocaust will always be an important moment in US military history and in American history and in the lives of the proud men and women whose lives were impacted by that intervention. All have an important story to tell. To be sure, this dialogue has to be persistent. For in remembering the past, we can hopefully prevent future genocides. We're very fortunate today to have such a distinguished panel to tell their story for you so that you can share it with your family, with your coworkers, with your friends, with your children, and all those around you. To tell them the acts of interveners, of rescuers, of liberators, will prove that the global community is never powerless to act, is never powerless to make a difference in the lives of individuals. To tell them to challenge and reject every form of hatred and to not look the other way when others are wronged, even at the simplest level. To tell them to have courage to come forward when others are being persecuted and to know that they have a responsibility as a human being to intervene. And most of all, to let them know that they have choices. There are always choices. The right choice, the decision that we make, will always matter. Thank you for your decision to be here today, to listen to the stories we're about to hear, and to be prepared to share them with others. Because in hearing the stories and remembering and not forgetting allows us to pave a path to ensure that we will never see the evil perpetrated again. It takes no small courage for our panel members to come forward, so I ask that you listen very carefully to what they have to say. They're to be commended and honored for their courage to speak so that we can learn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Major General Dunbar. I appreciate your sharing the story about the Hungarian survivor. I'm going to tell you a little bit about another Hungarian Czech survivor. My name is Leslie Weiss. My mother, Irene Weiss, arrived in the United States in 1947 from a Hungarian-speaking area of Eastern Europe that is now part of Ukraine. She married Martin Weiss in New York City and subsequently moved to Northern Virginia, had three children, attended American University, and received a BA in education. She worked for many years as an English as a second language teacher in Fairfax County Public Schools, where many of the students were immigrants, like herself. Some of these students were refugees from Vietnam and Cambodia, and they became very attached to my mother because of her special understanding of what they had gone through. But what had she gone through? When my brothers and I were growing up, we knew from a young age that there was something different about our family history. I knew my father's parents because they lived in the United States. But where were my mother's parents, her sisters and brothers? As we got older, my mother began to tell us about what had happened to her, uh, to them, and to the Jewish people. We also learned something of this history at our Passover seders, held every year with a few surviving family members. Our seders were never just about the cruel slavery inflicted on the ancient Hebrews and the exodus from Egypt, but about the suffering and death of Jews from recent history with our extended family as tragic participants in the story. Through the years, my mother's sense of responsibility as a witness to this history led her to speak in classrooms and churches to law enforcement officers and judges. As a volunteer in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, she was the keynote speaker at last year's International Holocaust Remembrance Day for the Washington Diplomatic Corps 
and she was recently interviewed about her wartime and Holocaust experience on the CBS Sunday Morning Program. Today, she will share some of that experience with you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Bogosian, and it is my pleasure to introduce Cesare Frustacci. The reason why I was chosen to introduce Mr. Frustacci is that my Armenian grandparents survived an earlier genocide, so I think folks thought that it would make sense that I have the honors. Mr. Frustacci recently wrote a book about his life story, a fantastic read. I think he has some copies with him after the ceremony if you want to talk to him. It is an amazing story. His Jewish-Hungarian mother was a classic ballerina who married a composer-musician father in Italy. Cesare was born in Italy in 1936. Soon after, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini expelled Jews from Italy, so Cesare and his mother had to leave his father and return to Hungary, where the persecution of Jews continued. Once separated, his father back in Italy wrote a love song for his mother called Tu Solamente Tu, which ironically became a popular song in Hitler's Germany and later was popularized by American bands. You're going to hear a version of it uh, later in the ceremony. In 1944, Cesare's mother, branded with a yellow star on her clothes and on her house, bravely put Cesare, age seven, out onto the streets of Budapest to survive on his own before she was sent to a concentration camp. Cesare somehow survived a series of ordeals until finally he landed with a farmer's family that took him in and changed his name. Miraculously, his mother survived the concentration camp and after the war and a two-year search found Cesare and they returned to life in Budapest. If those ordeals were not enough, the persecution continued years later when Cesare tried to leave Hungary to reunite with his father in Italy. It was the 1950s and it was the Cold War and he was behind the Iron Curtain. And they tortured him until finally in 1956, the help, with the help of who would become Pope John Paul XXIII, he escaped to Italy where he reunited with his father and built a successful and productive life as a business executive, ultimately coming to the United States in 1982, where he became an American citizen who now lives in Florida. In getting to know Mr. Frustacci, I asked him why he wrote his book, this book, and does so many public speaking engagements, especially for young people. Uh, and he told me he had recently heard on the news some hateful Holocaust deniers. And he told me that right then and there, he dedicated the rest of his days to getting out and talking to young people as a witness, an eyewitness to the Holocaust. So please give a warm welcome to Cesare Frustacci. for her activities and spent uh, almost three years in Ravensbrück concentration camp. Uh, a similar story to my grandmother's is the story you will hear today by the guest that I am honored to introduce, Mr. Sayad Okic. He was born in 1962 in um, Prejador, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was then a part of Yugoslavia. In 1990, after the fall of communism throughout much of Eastern Europe, the ethnic groups and states that made up the nation of communist Yugoslavia began to question their conditions. In 1991, the breakup of Yugoslavia began with Slovenia and Croatia declaring their independence. On February 29, 1992, Bosnia and Herzegovina declared its independence. The Bosnian Serbs, who were supported by the Serbian government and the Yugoslav People's Army, mobilized their forces inside the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina in order to secure Serbian territory. Then, war soon broke out across the country, accompanied by ethnic cleansing of the Bosnian Muslim population, especially in eastern Bosnia. 
When the war started in 1992, Sayad was married and his wife, Fadila, was four months pregnant with their first child. When Preyador was attacked by the Serbs, his whole family and all of their Muslim neighbors were forced out of their homes. The men were separated from the women, and Sayad was taken to a detention center in the mining town of Omaska. Over a five-month period, more than 7,000 people would be brought there. They were never formally charged or apprised of their alleged crime. The conditions at Omaska were horrific. People were packed into rooms like sardines in sweltering heat. The walls there were covered in blood, dotted with human hair and flecks of skin. The complex at Omaska Mines was, in fact, a concentration camp. Upon his arrival at Omaska, Sayad realized he was in a death camp. Nightly, the guards would beat the prisoners with fists, with rifle butts, with sticks. Nightly, up to 150 people were executed. Hundreds of others died from their beatings. Sayad did not believe that he would survive until the war world finally found out about the camp. Some who survived this camp, including Sayad, were relocated then to another concentration camp named Ternapoye. Though not the death camp of Omaska, conditions at Ternapoye were not much better. Prisoners there were also tortured. They were raped. They were killed. After Sayad had been at the camp at Ternapoye for a while, world journalists came, and they witnessed the situation. Armed Serb soldiers withdrew from the view, and they removed the fence which had surrounded the camp. Later, a convoy was set up to transport more civilians from Prayat Preyador and a large group of men who had been detained in the camp were added to the convoy. On their way to central Bosnia, these men were killed at a place known as Korechanske Stenja, Stenja A, at Mount Vlasic. The, uh, the news of the massacre was spread around the world and prompted a UN team to come to Ternopole to register the concentration camp detainees in the hopes of preventing further killings. And this was the turning point that finally allowed Sayad and his wife to reunite. She had been held a prisoner in her own home, and she was finally able to visit him. After their son was born in late 1992, living situations continued to deteriorate. The ethnic cleansing continued. In December of 1992, Sayad and his family left their homeland on a UN-organized convoy to Karlovac, Croatia, joining other detainees, and in February of 1993, the family then moved to Italy, later arriving in the United States as refugees in December of 1994. Sayad and his family now live in the Chicago area. Though his experiences have left deep traumatic scars, he credits his move to the United States, the opportunities he has found here, and the joy of living once again with his family for restoring his life. Um, please join me in welcoming our third speaker, Sayad Okic. The author of the following words is unknown, but I, I wanted to share them with you. We light our candles by passing the light of memory and hope from one to another. Let us honor those whose lights were put out, whose dreams, hopes, and lives were stuffed out before they even lived for the one and a half million children. We light a candle for the untold millions for whom there is no one to mourn, whose entire families were annihilated, and who lie in unmarked graves. We light a candle for those who stood upright while others were bending to unmoral will, for the righteous among nations who risked and even gave their lives to help their fellow human beings. We light a candle for those brave soldiers who liberated the camps, who carried the dead and near dead in their arms to a kinder and more humane future, and for those who served with the Allied forces to put an end to tyranny and oppression. We light a candle for the nearly six million Jews and for the six million non-Jews who perished in a planned system of human destruction, the scale of which had never before been even imagined. We light a candle for those who live even now under the yoke of oppression in places where the threat of genocide is real and ever-present. 
Mark Twain said, man is the only animal that blushes or needs to. Now I'm going to ask Amy Kwan to sing Sauvian Toi du Jour. Slovakia that is now Ukraine. Yes. What happened to your family when the Nazis invaded? Nazis invaded Hungary. They instituted the Euro. Well, my mic is on. I think the mic is on. Maybe we move it up closer. OK. 
Okay, is that better? Is that better? No. <laughs> Just hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Okay. Okay. Okay, is that better? Okay, that works. Okay. So when the Nazis invaded Hungary, they instituted the Nuremberg Laws that took away light rights and liberties of the Jewish people. My father's business was confiscated. Jewish children could no longer go to schools. I was uh, expelled from Hungarian schools. The young men were taken into labor camps, to the front without weapons. In general, we lost all our rights and right to petition. Or, 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 and later on, we were actually um, expelled from our home and out of our country. Um, now, the Nazis ordered all girls uh, under the age of 16 to have their heads shaved. Right. How did your mother protect you after that? Well, at this time we were already in a ghetto with thousands of other Jewish families from regional, uh, regional uh, towns. Um, they sh shaved my hair. I was 13 years old, had long braids. When I came back my, to the place, my mother gave me a kerchief and put it on, and this time I looked like a little married woman who typically married women covered their heads. And so it had really important consequences later when I ended up in Auschwitz because during the um, separation at the arrival at the platform in Auschwitz, the Nazi separating young children and young adults mistook me for older than 13, and I was sent to the side of the living. So in, in a strange way that I think it gave me the first chance to survive. So you, you go from Czechoslovakia to Auschwitz. When the doors of the cattle car opened, what did you see? I mean, could, just can you describe for us what was happening? You're 13 years old. Well, yes, we had been locked in for some days, and no light and not much air. The doors opened and there was a tremendous amount of shouting and screaming of orders, get out, get out, get out, Nazi soldiers, uh, and leave everything behind. So at this point, we just have our, what's on us. We quickly put on some extra clothes. I was wearing a big heavy coat. We all jumped out, left our stuff behind, and then there was more shouting and yelling to men go to one side and women and children to the other, and then each formed the column. Um, the women and children were moving up the column together with my mother and my four siblings. And all of a sudden we were facing a dozen Nazi soldiers who were doing the very quick separation. And, um, sent my mother off with two little boys to one side and a sister who's 17 to another side with the young adults. And then I was left with my 12-year-old sister holding hands. And since I was so dressed and my head covered, the Nazi soldier hesitated for a moment what to make of me and then quickly separated me from my sister, sent me towards the young adults and her to where my mother had gone with the younger children. I hesitated to leave because I was very concerned if my sister would catch up with my mother. There was a crowd of moving people very fast. And uh, at, very, at that very point, uh, unknown to me, a Nazi soldier was assigned to take pictures of the arrival of Hungarian transports and the separation and all, all that went with it. And I am caught in a picture that is now in the Holocaust Museum as one of the uh, uh, original photographs. I've seen that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to move on, but you were, you were only 13. You must have been saying to yourself, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to our family? Very true. I always felt that we were guilty of nothing. 
And in a way, that's a comfort, because it wasn't just an individual who, who might have done something wrong, but an entire population, old and young. And it was quite evident to me that it was some kind of uh, group treatment for no, no reason for it, no, no cause. No reason. No reason whatsoever. A civilian population with lots of children and pregnant women and, and just regular people unarmed. Madness. Mr. Cesare Frustacci, you were born in Napoli, Italy? Yes, yes. To, I, to a I Jewish remember. mother who was originally uh, from Hungary. She was a famous ballerina, prima ballerina, yes? Correct. Your father was a musician, composer, conductor? Yes. But under Mussolini, the Italian government expelled foreign Jews. That would include your mother, so you and yeah, your mother... That was the anti-Semitic laws that they started the fascist government to... So you and your mother were deported to Hungary. This is in October of 38? Yeah, correct. My mother was expelled, and I, she didn't want to leave that two years old child with... Uh... So... All right. You, you know, now you're now you're in in, in uh, Hungary, but but it's clear that the the, the fact that you're Jewish is 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 a, is a terrible problem. So when you're seven, she put you out on the street. Well, uh, in 1944, in April, actually, uh, they arrived uh, the Hungarian Nazis to our apartment and they escorted us to a ghetto. Uh, at that time, there were existed ghetto buildings in Budapest, which were marked with a huge yellow star, so that everybody knew that they were Jews living in that building. Now, to come to my story, my mother, she was a, a very uh, smart woman. She understood the situation, also because it was well known at that time that Jewish and Gypsy children were rounded up, took to the Danube River, and they were throwing the children into the river to drown. Into the Danube? Exactly. And today, as a matter of fact, there is a, a memorial uh, 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 statue in the river, at the Danube to uh, commemorate all the thousands of children that they were murdered. Now at that time my mother took my hand and uh, took me down on the street and in my opinion took the ultimate sacrifice that a mother can take. She said, now son, listen and listen carefully. This is your baptism certificate. Catholic. Catholic. And, yes. Put it in your pocket. This is your birth certificate that you are an Italian citizen and put it on your ladder. So you are not a Jew, but a Roman Catholic, and you are not a Hungarian, but you are an Italian. And now, very carefully listen to me. Remember my words. Never ever return to this place. Now, lower your head. And I still can feel her little hands on my head. And she blessed me. And then she said, now, go and find yourself a place to sleep and something to eat. And God bless you. And she let me go. Um, <coughs> then you find yourself in the street and you have three problems to solve. Exactly. Well, at that time, in that moment, I, I, I was sitting on the sidewalk. I didn't know what to do with myself. And then I, very, I, I came to the conclusion that I have three problems to solve. A, to sleep somewhere. B, to eat something. And C, to hygienic necessities. Therefore, uh, I started with hiding in a dark cellar for many months and that was the solution of the lodging. I was collecting tennis balls in a tennis court and the players gave me the tip 
and that was the solution of the food. And then I asked the tennis court management if I can wash and clean the bathrooms and the showers, and they said yes. And that was the solution of the <laughs> hygienic problem. You're a very smart seven-year-old. <laughs> well, I started using my brain, and I think that so should all the youngsters today not delegate everything, but start using their brain. And when they come in front of a problem, they never ever should say why this problem cannot be solved. They have to think about how this problem should be solved. Now, we have to move along. You end up in the care of the Jesuit fathers, correct? Well, later, several months later, I was caught and uh, I was uh, deported to a former, former uh, orphanage that the Nazis transformed into detention camp. And yes, that detention camp was managed by six Jesuit priests and three commanders. The commanders were Nazis in not in uniform and with them. And yes, that was a very good solution for me because the Jesuit priests were extremely good to us. And uh, I can tell you that some of them took the ultimate sacrifice. They died of hunger because they gave their portion of food to the children. Wow. All right. Now, you survive. But, you know, you end up in Hungary behind the Iron Curtain. You're 18. You want to go back to Italy. See your father. You want to get an education. Then what happens? Well, what happens is that the Holocaust, for many survivors, is not finished with the Second World War because the Holocaust had consequences. And for me and my family, my mother, the consequence was that we were caught in the Cold War behind the Iron Curtain from where they did not let us go out. Therefore, we couldn't return to Italy, we couldn't join my father. And therefore, uh, this is what happened, that I was there until uh, a, a miracle happened. I was, uh, the Hungarian government was uh, forcing me to adapt the Hungarian citizenship and renounce the Italian citizenship. What I was prepared not to do and preserve my Italian citizenship even at the cost of my life. What they did, they tortured me. They tortured me, they kept me in, in jail, and they did everything for me to assume the Hungarian citizenship. Their motivation was that they educated me. Now I am ready to give back, because I am a good engineer, give back my knowledge to the people who paid for my education. And instead, I want to go to the capitalistic countries who are our enemies and work against us. So you're a traitor. You are a thief. And you know what deserves a thief and a traitor? Jail. Cardinal Angelo Roncalli intervenes. Yes? Well, short story. Make, make it a short Very story. shortly, what happened is that for a series of miracles, the uh, Cardinal Angelo Roncalli, who was the Cardinal of Venice at that time, Patriarch of Venice, was right. informed of my situation. And he took on himself to go to Rome, took to Gaetano Martino, who was the Minister of the Foreign Affairs. And Gaetano Martino issued, in name of the Italian Republic, a, a protest to the Hungarians for the immediate release of the Italian citizens, Cesare Prostaci, who is kept captive in Hungary against his desire. And Angelo Lacali became Pope John the Twenty-Third. Now, two, Saint... two years later, <laughs> he became the good Pope. John the Monitor, and last week he became a saint. <laughs> God bless his then. memory. Now, Mr. Sayad Okic, uh, 
What happened to you and your wife when the war in Bosnia started? Uh, when the war was started, uh, first, uh, as you heard... Can you move the microphone up? Yeah. Right? After we were forced out from our houses, uh, we were gathered on one field of the city, uh, all together, all families. Uh, and uh, my wife, pregnant at that time, we just stayed for a short period of time and uh, interrupted by armed soldiers, you know, to be separated from each other. And I just... Uh, wanted to say to my wife, but uh, I couldn't say anything, I don't know, I just, you know, I didn't have any words because I didn't know what's going on. And uh, when uh, she disappeared from my sight, you know, gunshots, sound of the fireplace of burning houses, and uh, interrupted and made me worse, thinking what will happen that night to her, because she stayed at home as a hostage. She stayed at home? Yes, yeah, they moved all women to home, you know, and to do what they want, you know. I never talked with my wife about that, but... Uh, then you went to Camp Omarska? Yes, actually, my father, who was just retired, prior happening that, and my older brother and all my community transported toward for us unknown uh, place in that moment, but later on we realized it's a concentration camp in Pomerska. And you don't know why you're there, but the fact is no. you're there because of your religion. You're a Muslim. Right, right. Uh, when I entered to one of those buildings, I saw so large number of people sitting shoulder to shoulder with bended knees. Uh, the same people who just days before worked in uh, city hall offices, in companies, small farmers, uh, medical staff for uh, hospitals. Everybody was there, you know. I, I, that night, you know, I even didn't know what's going on, you know. I was thinking, you know, at some point, uh, even my father asked me, are we going to home? Are we going to home? But the days later, when killing started, we all realized it's a death camp. You saw starvation, you saw killings, you saw beatings, you saw torture. Exactly. Starvation, you know. We had uh, uh, just once per day meal, very small piece of spoiled bread, and, a very, and unknown, uh, and a bowl of soup, unknown grain. It's, and we were, we were forced to eat in a couple of minutes and go out. And uh, torture, killing uh, was on the way going uh, toward uh, to eat, you know. They sorted us in groups by 30, and we had to run through the corridor of the people who had uh, uh, armed Serb soldiers, not soldiers, but I would say mixed with uh, everything, what they were, you know, criminals, whatever I can call, you know. And they actually hold the sticks, uh, uh, wood, uh, wood made or steel made, and they were hit. Uh, we, uh, even one group of the disabled people, some of them, they have uh, short legs or disabled arms. They were grouped and forced to run through that corridor. Even usually they were hit the, the last ones. And I could see, you know, the first 70 or 80 years old man, you know, trying to walk, to run, falling down, and others just scrambled, stumbled to each other, you know. And uh, we had to take also, we couldn't take care about us, but we tried to care about disabled, mentally disabled people who were with us, you know, and they even didn't know that they are in a concentration camp, you know. And some of them, instead of running in this direction, they, my neighbor, you know, just, uh, he was running in, out of that line, you know. And uh, some people shouted, uh, tried to say, soldiers, don't, don't shut him, you know. But we heard gunshot, he was falling down, you know. This is 1992. It's almost 50 right. years since the end of World War II. You must be saying to yourself, why is this happening? Uh, when I was in high school, 
I was reading a lot of books, what's happening during Second World War, Auschwitz. We were very knowledgeable about that. But uh, at that time when I was in Omerska, I was asking myself so many times, you know, why is happening to me? Why I am here? Why? why but uh, why those people who are on the other side, to whom, with whom I, I just grew up together, same language, same tradition, you know, just, I don't know, you know. Is, let, let me ask the three of yeah. you. Uh, General Dunbar mentioned uh, Rwanda. Uh, General Allaire, the former commander of the UN peacekeeping mission in Rwanda, says that even 14 years after, and years of therapy after what he saw there, his greatest enemy is the night time and his dreams, the dreams right. that come with it. Is that true of you as well? Yes, uh, I still can handle today my trauma, but uh, my father couldn't. He was suffering for so many years uh, from trauma and became more worse and worse. Every day he was asking me for help, for help. And uh, at 2000, in 2009, he passed away. I went to Bosnia and I buried him in my own hands, you know, with my older brother to place him into the, ra to the grave and uh, leave him to rest in peace. Miss Weiss, you still have nightmares? You have to hold the microphone up. No, not, not nightmares, but I think that there is a, a wound that has never healed completely. And there are reflections in the relationship with others. Um, everything relates to that. And your con my concept, I, I think I have a, a, a different outlook. Um, I'm not the same person I might have been. No. So it, it has its uh, uh, um, the results some other way. Cesare, let me ask you, what's your message to President Obama and world leaders after what you folks have gone through? Well, frankly, I, I am not qualified because I, have no, I am not expert in social sciences. So I don't feel like being qualified to giving advices to world leaders or President Obama. That's so, all right, but, we'll give you a pass on it, okay? But what I can do, I can address the people of my category who are the everyday, simple, ordinary human beings. And uh, for them, what I would like is to quote Virgil and Dante Alighieri from the 14th century. Quote, in hell, the hottest locations, places, are reserved for those who in time of moral crisis remain neutral code closed. And now I would like one more thing to do. It's we survivors are at our, our 11th hour. Soon we won't be around to testify and give our witness expert vision what we have seen. I am carrying a torch. And now I would like to pass this torch to the younger generations. Your thoughts, sir? I would say uh, we, as uh, human beings, we are emotionally connected. And we should help each other. That's all. Ms. White? Well, also speaking to the younger people, that 
any, any charismatic leader with a platform in propaganda can influence young people to forget their religion, their civilization, their humanity, and turn on their fellow men. I think watch out for propagandists who want you to do something against your neighbors. Well, it's an honor to share the stage with you. Thank you very much. Oh, three. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a few uh, final thoughts here. Uh, on November 21st, 1945, in the Palace of Justice at Nuremberg, Germany, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackton, who was acting as the Chief Counsel for the United States at the Nuremberg Trials, the prosecutor, said this, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. Primo Levi, an Italian Jew, writes of his time in Auschwitz, even in this place one can survive. One must want to survive to tell the story, to bear witness. We still possess one power, and we must defend it with all our strength, the power to refuse our consent. And finally, Martin Niemöller, a prominent Lutheran minister, was imprisoned at Dachau and Sachsenhausen, where there's a hierarchy of prisoners, uh, criminals at the top, then communists, then homosexuals, then Jehovah's Witnesses, then Jews. Niemöller, who later confessed that he himself had once been infected by the disease of anti-Semitism, wrote this. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Now let me ask Amy Kwan to sing a song composed by Cesare Fotasi's father Pasquale after Cesare and his mother had been expelled from Italy. To Solamente Tu, you fascinating you. Thank you. 
Amy Kwan, thank you very much. Before we leave, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Ambassador and Mrs. Claudio Bosignero. Thank you very much for being here with us. And uh, Adnan Hadrovic, the embassy from the Embassy of Bosnia Herzegovina. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a great audience. Thank you.